Um, I'm here to talk about terms of engagement, as you see there, with an important ally in our efforts to promote youth and community development. As you've probably guessed, that ally is youth themselves. The title of this presentation has a double meaning representing the two core questions that will be guiding our discussion today. The first is simply, what do we mean when we use the term youth engagement? The short answer is it depends. The term actually means different things to many different people. So we need to more specifically define the term youth engagement if we're going to work together to catalyze and to support the kinds of youth engagement that we in this room and we around the state of Minnesota want to promote. The second question is about the terms under which youth and adults are and should be engaging. What are the terms of youth and adult relationships? What are the conditions, the stipulations, the requisites of positive, effective youth engagement? I've spent the past 14 months exploring these questions through a review of the literature, through seven half-day regional forums throughout the state where we asked practitioners how they define youth engagement, what they see as the goals of their youth engagement efforts, what they've learned it takes to do this work well, and how the university might help. I've done direct observation of promising programs and practices. I've done focus groups with young people who are involved in those programs, and you'll be hearing from a lot of them during the presentation today. I've done interviews with effective youth engagement practitioners, whom several of us around the center have come to think of as our youth engagement wizards, Although secretly, as a Star Wars fan, I've been thinking of them as the youth engagement Yodas. <laughs> and so some of them are here today. You'll see them on the screen today. But Eric Billiet, do you want to stand up? And Ed Irwin, they're in the, in the crowd today. <laughs> Becky Saito. <laughs> Becky, stand up. Well, you'll see Becky today, too. And uh, Sharon Johnson, who couldn't be here today, but you'll see her on the screen. So after a round of individual interviews with these people, we got this group together for a videotape discussion about issues they face related to youth engagement. And you'll see clips from that discussion during the presentation today. I want you to know that the video clips that you'll see today were shot by young people at Kwanzaa Church's video unit, which is called the Elite Leadership Production. And I'm happy that you'll see some of their work. Okay, I'm hearing things quiet down. If you're like others that I've met around the state this year, and I've met a lot of people this year, you probably didn't all define youth engagement the same way, but there probably were some common themes that ran through your definitions. And I'm hoping that I'll touch on a lot of the definitions and a lot of the ideas you talked about at your tables today. If I don't, we're not going to do a report out from this particular thing, but if I don't, I'm hoping that you'll share those ideas in the Q&A, you know, a question that says, well, but I haven't heard anything about this, and I think this is really central to youth engagement, what gives? Um, or during other elements of the discussion in our time together. Youth engagement is very broadly defined in the literature as young people being actively involved in cognitive and social endeavors that promote growth. Is that broad enough for you? <laughs> now when you think of it in these broad terms, it's very clear that youth engagement is a core vehicle through which young people develop all they need to thrive as human beings, as workers, and as citizens. We seek to engage youth in a wide range of activities in and out of school time to promote the development of physical health, of academic achievement, psychosocial well-being, relational skills, leadership skills, a positive sense of personal identity, of purpose, of efficacy, and an attachment to supportive social networks and institutions. And while youth engagement is almost universally valued and sought after, almost as a holy grail of sorts in the, in the youth development field these days, different 
different voices really call for quite different ideals in the name of youth engagement. If you look in a thesaurus, you'll find several different synonyms for the word to engage. And those synonyms sort of help delineate a range of different meanings that youth development researchers and practitioners attach to the term. To engage can simply mean to participate. And for many, the goal of youth engagement is to ensure that all young people have opportunities to participate in safe, positive activities. Because research tells us when kids participate, they do better. This includes a wide range of activities, attending quality schools, participating in organized sports, arts, community service, church youth groups, showing up at street dances, block parties, or neighborhood meetings. Others are interested in getting young people to participate in order to achieve another definition of to engage, which is to connect. Again, research shows that young people do better when they feel connected to positive peers, to adult role models, and to positive places like schools, churches, neighborhoods, and community-based organizations. To be engaged is also to be engrossed in some pursuit. To engage someone is to attract and to hold their attention. In this case, engagement is actually a cognitive and emotional state where a person is involved and interested and enthusiastic about what they're doing. Jean Nakamura calls it vital engagement. Peter Benson and Peter Scales call it spark. And Chicks and Mahai who has basically built a career on promoting this kind of engagement, calls it flow. They characterize it as intense concentration, a loss of self-consciousness, as you can see, time flies, <laughs> and experiencing an activity as intrinsically rewarding. Again, this kind, of age, this kind of engagement can be achieved through a wide range of activities, with young people becoming engrossed in and passionate about things like literature, art, music, poetry, sports, math, science, debate, film production, auto mechanics, religious faith, or social and political issues. There are others out there that characterize youth engagement more as a social and a political dynamic. They focus on ways in which youth, adults, institutions, and communities engage with each other. For some in this group, to engage youth in an organization or community means to enlist their help in achieving the goals of that organization. This might include participating on an advisory board, fundraising, political advocacy, uh, participatory action research to inform programming, and promoting an organization's ideas, products, services to other young, young people in order to expand their participation. For others in this group, to engage is to get in the fray. It's to collectively vie with organizational, social, and political issues. They tout unique individual, organizational, and community benefits that are achieved through what they call collective leadership, in which youth and adults share decision-making authority as they identify and work toward shared goals. The activities in which youth and adults partner in collective leadership may be the same activities that others enlist their help in. What distinguishes this latter type of engagement is the shared decision-making as youth and adults work together to affect change. Research supports all these types of youth engagement as important vehicles for positive youth and community development. In fact, a thriving community for youth needs all these opportunities available for all young people. What Dale depicts as a menu of opportunities from which young people can choose a healthy, hearty diet of developmental experiences and opportunities to exercise their developmental muscles.
So based on these definitions and these ideas, which we found in use among practitioners and researchers in the literature and also um, all around the state, Becky Saito and I developed this model delineating four core types of youth engagement in the hope that it'll help in our efforts to create opportunities for all young people in the state to be engaged in all these ways. Most of you know Becky. If you don't, you'll be meeting, meeting her later this morning. Um, she's director of a statewide youth engagement initiative that's being launched by the University Extension Center for Youth Development. The four types of youth engagement that you see up here, participation, passion, voice, and collective leadership are not meant to represent a continuum. We're not saying that one leads to another with everybody ultimately trying to get to collective leadership. Again, a community needs opportunities for all these kinds of youth engagement in order to meet the needs of different young people at different points in their lives. Sometimes as kids participate, they find a passion. And as they have that passion, it gives them new ideas that they want to voice. And all of that motivates them to want to be part of a decision-making team. Sometimes it works that way. But we've seen every bit as many examples where it didn't work that way at all. For example, when kids find that they have a voice, that often enhances their passion and their commitment. And we've seen lots of examples where people came together in a collective leadership model to create lots of opportunities for kids to participate. So the arrows go all different directions through these rings. And while each of the rings has unique characteristics that make them different from the others, Successful youth engagement of all these types has at its core authentic, trusting relationships among both youth and adults. This means that youth and adults listen to each other. They recognize and value each other's strengths. They treat each other with kindness, with empathy and respect. It means that youth and adults encourage and support each other. Adults encourage youth initiative and ownership while also offering guidance and sharing the wisdom that they've gained in their many years of experience. And that is, it goes back to the basic concept of embracing each other's humanity. Mm. You know what I mean? Whether, I don't care if it's ageism or sexism or racism or whatever isms that we tend to be controlled by, mm. is that how do we transcend that and embrace each other's humanity that we have, that person has value. That person has right to walk next to me, and I'm going to make space for that person in my space. Yeah. See, that's a, that's a profound challenge for us as human beings because we tend to always want to protect our space, our territory, our kingdom, our business, our house, you know, whatever it is. And so how do we say, you know, you're welcome into this space, okay? Because it's also risky. There's some folks who come in your space and mess it all up, okay? <laughs> but are you willing to take that risk with young people? and working in that space, and then walking and navigating all that stuff together that you're gonna have to do, okay? Because they're gonna impact our lives as well as us impacting their lives, as you know. And that's Ed Irwin, my screen has his name on it, but uh, that's Ed Irwin, Executive Director of the Nia Imani Youth and Family Development Center at uh, Kwanzaa Community Church. Now you know why I use video. Could I ever say it that well? And these ideas are really the ideas of the people that I met around the state this year, including the youth engagement Yodas. Okay, so with authentic relationships as the core that unites all these types of youth engagement, let's look at what distinguishes, what distinguishes each of the four rings, starting with participation. Young people participate in a range of formal, informal, and non-formal activities that offer opportunities to connect with positive people and places, as well as challenges and supports that promote growth and development. Everyone we talked to around the state saw this kind of engagement, getting kids in the door, connecting to something, as really important in their work. While most focus on providing opportunities for young people to participate in structured activities, 
Some also point to the, development, to the developmental benefits of non-structured informal activities that also provide important connections to be a part of important connections to people and places in the community. Those informal experiences can include things like pick up sports, informal activities organized by adults or youth in the neighborhood, a garage band, a lemonade stand, even a, a, water, balloon flight, a water balloon fight. And it can be simply hanging out and building relationships with positive peers and adults. Research has shown that benefits of participation and connection include positive psychological and social development, academic achievement, physical health, mastery of a whole range of skills and the sense of efficacy and agency that goes with that, reduction in risk-taking behavior, and positive identity development. And it can provide a gateway to some of the other kinds of youth engagement in this model. So how do we make it happen? Getting disconnected young people in the door participating requires understanding what keeps them on the outside in the first place. The most commonly reported barriers are that there just aren't the kinds of activities that interest young people. Or they, they don't know about the activities that do exist. For some, programs happen at times, places, or have associated costs that make them not accessible. Programs, some programs are perceived as disorganized, chaotic, or unproductive. Young people have competing priorities. A lot of them have to work and care for, care for siblings at home. Some young people prefer just unstructured time, just hanging out with their friends. And young people sometimes feel unwelcome or uncomfortable with staff or other people who are, who are their staff or other participants in a program. Overcoming these barriers requires talking to, listening to, and working with disconnected youth to create programs that they can and that they want to participate in. But while recognizing the barriers, we also need to understand what draws kids in, what motivates them to join. Young people commonly join activities to spend time with their friends. We know that. To meet new friends, to develop skills, to build a resume for college admission, or just to do something other than hanging out by themselves at home. They keep coming back when these goals are fulfilled and when they have fun, when they, feel, when they have fun and when they feel like they're growing and accomplishing something that's important to them. We also need to understand what motivates parents because they're often the ones who encourage or frankly make kids come. <laughs> they often provide transportation or the cash that allows kids to participate, especially with younger children. That changes as kids get older. But most parents are really looking for some basic things. They're looking for activities that keep their children occupied and out of trouble while building academic skills and positive, uh, positive peer relationships in safe environments that are supervised by, supervised by quality, by, excuse me, that are supervised by qualified adults, okay? Again, activities that keep their kids occupied and out of trouble while building academic skills and relationships with positive peers in safe environments supervised by qualified adults. Once we create opportunities that young people want to participate in and that parents want their kids to participate in, we need to effectively market those opportunities to young people and parents so they know they exist. Our second ring of engagement is characterized by passion with young people becoming engrossed in something that matters to them, something that gives life meaning. Researchers have actually identified several indicators of this kind of engagement. Some of them are behavioral. They see persistence, effort, and attention. Some of the other, some of the other indicators are emotional. They see enthusiasm, interest, and pride in success. The coaches at the Duluth East High School Nordic Ski Team 
And the, you see here Bonnie Fuller Cask, who has been really helpful in helping me understand what it takes to build passion. Um, they see as their core goal developing a passion for skiing so kids have something they can love for a lifetime. This is a competitive ski team, but the coach's goals are in this order learn how to cross country ski, develop mastery, love it for life to find a passion, to learn to set up a training plan, learning to identify and build on strengths. My asides are not at all how Bonnie would talk about it. Um, and finally, to ski as fast as you can. That's the, that's the fourth goal. And even there, it doesn't say ski any better than anybody else. It just says ski as fast as you can. Along the way, they create a community. Parents put on pre-race dinners are in and are involved in everything that the team does. Skiers and parents gather for annual social events, including an annual trip to West Yellowstone, where they gather with a national community of top skiers. On Mentor Mondays, high school juniors and seniors pair up with freshmen and, so freshmen and sophomores, and they practice together. Team members in the high school team support elementary school, ski elementary school skiers when they help out the, at the annual snowflake ski. So what happens as a result? Well, it boosts participation, that's for sure. This high school cross-country ski team has 75 to 100 participants each year. That's 10% of the student body for a sport that gets no glory. <laughs> you don't see a lot of pep rallies for the cross-country ski team. There's no cheerleaders at the cross-country ski meets, okay? They have 75 to 100 participants each year compared with 10 to 14 at the other Duluth high schools. They win. <laughs> They've won nine state championships in the last 12 years. Many are still skiing 10 years later, and a lot of those alumni come back to help out with the team. Kids say they build long-term friendships, and what I heard from several participants is that they really do become integrated into this multi-generational community that shares their passion for skiing, but that also shares their values and reinforces their values. And of course, they get the satisfaction of doing something difficult, seeing themselves improve, and winning. And those are from the, that's from the mouths of the kids, but they can say it better than I can. I think. If a kid just wants to come and play ping pong, and play ping pong <laughs> then she's yeah. fine with it. Then, she's, yeah, she's not going to make them do anything. She just mm -hmm. wants them to, she's trying to instill maybe a love in skiing. Like right. she, and I, she, she's told the team that her main goal of the ski season is to get people to enjoy skiing right. and get make people to keep, sport. yeah, and get, make it a life sport. For, I was taken under the wings of Joe Tofty and Will Mitchell, who were the seniors when I was a sophomore. And like, they taught me to appreciate like wit and intelligence um, and like hard work and they didn't, care about image, they didn't have an image, nor did they want to, and so I really think it altered my character, or just allowed me to be who I was. Also, like, East kind of has this prestige when it comes to skiing, yeah. and yeah, we're true. good, and no, it, it, it's, <laughs> like, it's fun to do well, and yeah. You know that the coaches are going to do their best to help you to do well, and it's fun to do well. So I like that keeps me coming back. Yeah. Some of the background giggles were when the guy says, "We're we're good," and somebody else says, "And humble." <laughs> Search Institute has some new research and a new book that's coming out any day now. I just got my notice from Amazon saying it's coming sooner than we thought. That shows a clear link between young people finding a passion, finding what they call their spark, and academic success, physical health, life satisfaction, and pro-social behavior. In addition, people who are more psychologically engaged in activity tend to learn more. 
And when kids pursue an activity over a long period of time, they often, like the Duluth skiers, become part of a community of people who do that activity, offering the kind of connection that we talked about is so important. The bottom line is the passion makes you want to do more of something. It motivates people to continue to learn and practice. The fact that adults tend to be drawn to kids who are passionate means that young people will have an easier time finding opportunities to do just that. And young people who get a taste of all these social and emotional benefits of passion sometimes look for other opportunities to get more of the same. And that leads to this ever-expanding commitment to growth and meaningful connection in all aspects of their lives. Sounds great, right? So again, how do we make it happen? Well, it's really interesting to me that program features that the literature and people around the state identified as critical to creating this type of youth engagement overlap greatly with the core tenets of basic positive youth development. Physical and emotional safety, a sense of belonging and camaraderie, opportunities to socialize with peers, authentic relationships with caring adults, cultural, re cultural relevance, a personal connection to an idea or cause, choices so they can find something that fits them, identifying and building on young people's strengths, the right balance of freedom to do as they please and the structure that helps them get something done and makes them feel safe. Opportunities to experience autonomy, mastery, leadership, and a chance to make a meaningful contribution in the real world. Chicks and Mahai says passion or flow is more likely when experience offer clear goals, immediate feedback, and challenges for which success is in our grasp but we really have to stretch our capacities to make it work. What sets apart experiences in the next string of youth engagement is that young people have opportunities to voice their ideas and have input into programs and policies that affect them. While youth don't have decision-making authority in this type of youth engagement, they do have the power to influence programs and policies by sharing their perspectives, by sharing their ideas and their knowledge, and by making a persuasive case to adults who have the ultimate decision-making authority. This includes bringing youth onto adult, the adult boards of an organization, or specifically creating a youth advisory board. Events like the Governor's Youth Summit last summer um, that was basically designed specifically to get youth input on programs and policies that affect them. Sometimes youth are involved in research and evaluation, sharing their own ideas while also gathering the opinions and ideas of other young people to inform programs and practices. Having input into programs and policies becomes actually more important as young people enter into adolescence. It gives them a sense of efficacy and agency, a chance to see themselves as people who can and who do make organizations in the community a better place. This becomes a strong, mater, a strong motivator to continue to try to make organizations and communities better. This kind of engagement can help young people develop problem solving, communication, and advocacy skills and it's been associated with overall academic achievement. At the same time it benefits individuals, it also benefits organizations and communities. Young people are uniquely qualified to help us create programs that people like them are more likely to participate in and become passionate about. And frankly, a lot of people, especially those promoting adoption of the International Rights of the Child Act, consider youth having a voice in decisions that affect them as a fundamental human right. For young people to stay engaged in this way, opportunities to voice their ideas and provide input have to be authentic. That means adults have to truly listen to and value the wisdom that young people bring and integrate that into their own thinking and use it to actually guide their decisions. 
coming back to show young people how their input has actually affected decision making can help them see that their ideas really were taken seriously. It's particularly important that programs not engage just a few token youth on a board, for example, and assume that they speak for all young people. Rather, we need to engage enough diverse youth to meaningfully represent the perspectives and needs of all the youth that we serve. To do all of this successfully, youth and adults need to develop some unique perspectives and skills. That includes active listening, truly appreciating the strengths that each participant brings to the table, being able to facilitate effective conversations so everybody gets heard, and an ability to apply new learning to improve programs and practices. New Moon Girls is an organization up in Duluth whose mission is to encourage girls to use their voice and to feel included and valued as they work together to create social change. What is it? Well, at its core, it's a magazine for 8 to 12 year old girls that has now also expanded to the Luna Vida Club, which is an online club for New Moon readers, and Orb 28, which is an online club for older girls, 12 to 15 year olds. They have opportunities for different levels of input. Readers can submit articles, artwork, poetry, letters to the editor. They contribute through online postings and chats. There's a national advisory group that meets virtually, providing feedback on current content and input for, to and input for future topics of interest and for ways that those topics are discussed and presented. But New Moon also offers opportunities that go beyond young people just having input. The magazine and web community each also have a girls' advisory board in which young people actually have the power to decide what goes into the magazine and what goes up on the website. That decision-making power puts these opportunities into a different ring of engagement for our model. When youth and adults share decision-making authority as they work together to achieve, to achieve shared goals, it fits within what we're calling collective leadership, which is a term borrowed from the Innovation Center for Youth and Community Development in their work with the Kellogg Foundation. Most of you have read the, have read the research by Highscope and may have noticed that they actually identified meaningful involvement in decision-making as a key aspect of quality after school programs, especially for older youth. At New Moon, they call this sharing the power. And when I asked the girls on the magazine editorial board how it works, they reiterated exactly what I'd heard from adults. The girls decide what they want in the magazine, they make all the editorial decisions, and the adults, the girls say, and the adults make it happen. <laughs> the, um, the adults do design, layout, production, they make the policy decisions for the overall organization, and the adults see as central to their jobs, providing structure and processes that help the girls use their decision-making power effectively. Adults also share what they've learned from past experiences in their discussions with the girls. For example, when girls wanted to publish a very controversial article, the adults shared what, they, what had happened in the past when they'd done that. They talked about nasty letters to the editor. They talked about canceled subscriptions. And the kids took that in and considered that in making their decision to go ahead and publish the article. And when all those things happened, they were ready to deal with them. They knew they were coming. When I asked these girls how they're different because of their experiences at New Moon, they talked about a lot of the same outcomes we've seen in relation to some of the other rings of engagement. They got new skills. They learned to work as a team. They also learned a lot about a variety of social and political issues. But having the decision-making power added an important additional outcome for them. One girl said it this way, it makes me feel good and powerful. Powerful because it makes you feel stronger. It's something that makes adults and grown-ups know that they can do things and make things possible. It talks about like 
stereotypes and stuff. Um, if people read about that in New Moon, then they might start thinking, oh, maybe that wasn't really true. I think I should stop stereotyping those people. And so it can, those kind of things can, they seem, may, may seem kind of small, but they actually kind of make a big difference. So, um, like our letters to Congress that you, it was about girls writing their opinions to Congress. And now Congress, I think, is paying more attention. That last piece, it's in this, in the echo, is that they did a letter of letter to Congress issue of the magazine, and the, she felt like Congress was really starting to pay more attention. So you can see that in addition to those individual goals, that sen sense of efficacy and personal power, these girls also feel like they're achieving some important societal goals. They're changing the world around them. In some collective leadership models, young people have clearly defined authority to shape policy and to make certain kinds of decisions within current systems. Like the New Moon Girl, setting editorial uh, guidelines and making editorial decisions for youth magazine. In other cases, young people have the power to decide who gets certain grants for youth programming. They have the ultimate decision-making authority within a foundation to spend a certain a certain, uh, a certain segment of that foundation's funds on youth programs that they think make a difference. Some researchers and practitioners distinguish between this kind of shared, deci shared decision making within systems and youth and adults sharing the power to change systems and create new programs. The Nobles County Integration Collaborative uses what they call youth-led programming. The program is actually a process through which youth and adults come together to create and implement after-school programs. When we say youth-led, mm -hmm. we want the youth to feel that their talents are valued, mm -hmm. that their voice is heard, mm -hmm. um, that we are all working together, um, that it's not a hierarchy of I'm in charge and I tell this person what to do and she's going to tell you all what to do and that's what's going to happen in this program. That right. we sit around and collaborate together and talk about what direction do we want to go. I'm very fortunate to have an advisory council who is open to that idea that youth can be the leaders, they have ideas, they can make it work. Um, sometimes it might take a little bit longer, it doesn't fit in the time frame that we necessarily want things to work in, but the end result is so much better. Uh, the quality is better and the enthusiasm and the passion is there um, if we allow that process to take place. That's Sharon Johnson, the executive director of the Nobles County Integration Collaborative and one of our Yodas. Current programs for this collaboration include, these are the programs that the young people came up with. One is called Dynamic 507, which is a service learning group. Odyssey is, does a lot of career and college tours. They have a hip-hop hip dance group and a theater group that perform all over, um, all over Nobles County, which is out by Worthington. All these groups came together last year for they got a grant from Project Ignition and the groups all came together to put together an assembly program that they went out to schools in the area presenting their ideas about um, distractions while driving, the kinds of distractions that cause a lot of accidents and kill a lot of teenagers. And so they used their talents and their ideas and brought those out to other young people uh, to have an impact on an issue that mattered to them. Now, the way young people see it in Nobles County, they generate the ideas, and adults help them, I, help them develop those ideas and make them happen. Adults act as liaisons with other adults, sharing their connections in the community. That's an important thing that they bring. And adults ultimately have veto power, but they've never had to use it. <laughs> For example, when the hip hop group came up with a name for their own group that the adults thought was going to be offensive to some people in the community. 
They talked about that. They talked about possible consequences. And the young people decided to use a different name because they decided it was in their best interest to use a different name. Again, young people participating uh, in this collaborative talk about a lot of the same outcomes we've heard about in the other rings of engagement. They had fun. <laughs> they made friends. It keeps them out of trouble. They're learning how to work in teams of diverse people. And the program has actually been able to document that young people's grades improve when they participate. In addition, these kids talk about gaining some foundational leadership skills. One girl said, this place shows you how to lead the group. Not like bossy, but how to start to get the ball rolling. If you, not if you notice the group is not interacting, kind of start with an icebreaker or something. Just ask who has an idea and just hope that someone has an idea that someone else will put onto that and then go on and on. That's a 14-year-old's version of participato participatory leadership. And they find themselves being motivated to continue their community involvement. It's like, you know, being involved here and having a say in whatever goes on, it leads like to your adult life, like whether you're involved in being like who's going to be president and voting and following that or not kind of thing because like you know it kind of helps you understand like what you say does count or you know what you do can influence someone else's decision An important outcome in some of the other rings of engagement, as you may have noticed, is young people building their individual sense of identity. Proponents of collective leadership talk about building a sense of civic identity, a sense of who one is in relation to or as a member of a group, a community, a global society. In addition to, be, in addition to building an individual sense of efficacy, collective leadership builds a sense of collective efficacy. A belief that together we can do more than any of us can accomplish on our own. The focus moves from individual decision making and problem solving to building skills for collaborative decision making and problem solving. Young people often come away with a greater critical consciousness, an ability to see things that aren't as they should be, to understand why they are the way they are, and to be able to figure out what it would take to change it. You may have noticed that a consistent outcome across the other rings of engagement, which frankly has been critical to them being able to get the funding they need from certain sources, has been academic achievement. Proponents of, collective, uh, proponents of a collective leadership model often talk about moving beyond academic achievement. They say that academic achievement is certainly critical, but is not sufficient for 21st century leaders, workers, or citizens. Leadership gurus across sectors are touting the importance of what some call participatory leadership skills in our rapidly changing multicultural world. These skills, things like collaborative, real-world problem solving, are not typically the focus of scores that count for academic achievement. They're, they don't show up in grades and in test scores. Some have found that collective leadership is particularly effective for engaging previously disengaged youth. Youth often disengage from programs because they don't reflect their values or meet their needs. One way to engage these youth is for adults to join with them to change systems and to create new opportunities that do match their values and meet their needs. And when diverse youth get engaged in this way, these individual outcomes lead to important organization, community, and societal outcomes. As people of all ages and of diverse cultural and socioeconomic groups help to shape organizations, those organizations will come to more broadly reflect the values and meet the needs of all community members. And those who participate in social change efforts in, in adolescence often internalize a sense of themselves as the type of person who can affect change, making them more likely to continue to engage in these ways throughout youth and adulthood. To achieve the sustained commitment that this kind of engagement requires, it's important for youth and adults to identify issues about which they are passionate, issues that affect their daily lives, and then connect those issues to larger systemic and social issues. 
Collective leadership requires youth and adults to be open to new ideas about their roles and their relationships in order to collaborate in ways that fully capitalize on the strengths of each individual to achieve shared goals. It's hard when we kind of talk about, well, how does that really work out in terms of encouraging young people to take leadership roles and empowering them and having it be youth driven? Because I think the tendency is that we want to think then that means that adults just have to slowly yeah. just disappear or, yeah. <laughs> or not be in the community anymore. No role for us. No yeah. role for us. And it's old fogies. Yeah, old fogies. Like, yeah. We are old fogies, but you know that. <laughs> uh, but I think the reality of what I'm hearing you say in that, that relationship building that really resonates with me is that that means that we're committed to be in relationship together. So this sojourn of life, mm -hmm. we're walking together. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily with the young people out front, are behind, but alongside of us. Mm -hmm. And that's the call, is that like how that. we do that together mm -hmm. you know, in real relationships, mm -hmm. in modest relationships. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, uh, a professor who I really admire uh, spoke about some years ago and talked about there's been no historical record where one generation has willingly just passed the torch to the next generation. Mm -hmm. That's a myth. That all of a sudden you're gonna have, you know, well here, take the power and go and good luck, you know, <laughs> and all that. It doesn't happen that way. It's usually that next that younger generation has to somehow take the power. <laughs> and so I think part of what we need to learn how to do is how do we navigate, I'm gonna call it that white water of that transition of power taking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And stay in the struggle and end the discussion versus say, okay, well, if you're going to take it, I'm going to just leave and buy. Yeah. You do it your way, and, and I got no part of it. But no, let's stay there, and let's wrestle mm -hmm. with this thing. Mm -hmm. Because youth and adults don't commonly share decision-making authority in our society, we adults do have a tendency to take over. And frankly, young people sometimes allow that to happen. So it's important for participants to develop skills for facilitating collective goal setting, planning, and decision making to ensure that collective decisions and actions in fact, in fact do reflect the values, desires, and needs of all the participants. A critical aspect of successful engagement of this type is being transparent about who has the authority and the responsibility to make what kinds of decisions with youth and adults holding each other accountable for their commitments. As the people in Nobles County discovered, it's important to help individuals identify their own strengths, their own passions, and their own needs, and to connect people with opportunities to continually grow and develop in ways that are important to them, which also then enhances their value in the group. Finally, youth and adults working to affect organization and, communi and community change have to remain flexible. They have to be able to understand and adapt to constantly changing dynamics as their work progresses. They're changing the community. They're now dealing with a different community and they have to recognize the ways in which that community is different. Both the literature and youth engagement experts around the state make it clear that a healthy community in which all young people can thrive must have all these kinds of opportunities in order to meet young people where they are and help them grow and expand their capacities, their interests, and their connections in the community. As such, opportunities for all these kinds of youth engagement are actually elements of a single thriving organism in which growth in one element contributes to the healthy development of the others. Some provide all of these opportunities for young people within a single program. Others provide one or two elements and connect young people to other organizations when they're ready for something their program just isn't equipped to provide. If this is to happen, a healthy community for youth needs a collaborative infrastructure through which we can help young people find and access opportunities that fit their changing needs as they grow and develop. Becky calls this the fifth ring. <laughs> the Garage, which is located in Burnsville, is a program that strives to offer all these different kinds of opportunities. It started out with youth and adults coming together in a collective leadership model 
which led to them creating more opportunities for lots of kids to participate. When asked what the garage is, young people offer a variety of answers. Some will say it's a community center. Others said it's an all-ages music venue showcasing local young musicians. For others, it's a fun place to do something other than sit at home and play video games. For some, it's a place to hang out, to be with friends, and to make new friends. There were several who described it as an accepting community, a judge-free zone. And there were several who said it's a democracy, where you have a voice and people of all ages take you seriously. The executive director, Eric, who you'll see in a minute, describes it much like Sharon describes her initiative in Nobles County. He says it's a process. It's a way of youth and adults working together to create meaningful youth programs. What we want to do is give people opportunity or to create a structure with opportunities mm -hmm. to engage at different levels. Mm -hmm. Whether it be to just come and sit um, and enjoy it as a sanctuary, as we heard, a place where you can be around other people who are different mm -hmm. and not feel judged, um, to be able to express yourself in a community and, and be accepted for who you are. Uh, I think that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. But maybe you want to be in a dance class, and you just want to be in a dance class, and, and you want myself and the staff to develop and find people who can teach a dance class. Or maybe you want to teach that dance class, and we're going to try to give you the resources and help you be able to do that. Um, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. You know, it, but we're, we're, we're always trying. The garage has systems in place to ensure that young people have opportunities to engage in these variety of ways. Participants in after-school programs, musicians that play there, volunteers and staff of all ages participate in a lot of pizza parties <laughs> where all the participants have input into not just what the garage is going to do next week or next month, but actually have input into what the garage should be. There are then smaller teams of youth, adults, participants, volunteers, and staff. So youth and adults are, play all of those different roles. And this smaller group will take those ideas, develop them, and come back to the bigger group for feedback. Then there's an even smaller advisory group, again, made up of people of all ages, that act as, liaison with, as the liaisons with public officials, the mayor, the city council, the police department, all of which have a say in what goes on in the garage. And so, for example, the city wanted, to do, wanted the garage to participate in a fitness program that they were doing citywide. Young people at the garage just sort of said, that's lame. <laughs> and, but as they continued in the discussion, somewhere in the discussion it came out that the police department has a weight room. And there were a bunch of these young people who said, we got a lot of people who would love to do a weightlifting class. And so that's what evolved from that conversation, is what started out as a fitness program that was not going to there was not going to be a lot of participation in the fitness program as, as it was presented at the garage. But it turned into a weightlifting class with young people lifting weights with police officers in the police department um, gym. Hoping I have that right. <laughs> um, so like I say, the, the infrastructure is there for people to have lots of different kinds of input. And when I talk to Eric about this, he usually says, he usually says he wants that infrastructure to be there, so whether he's there or not, the basic fundamental philosophies of collective leadership are in place. So all this sounds great, right? Well, that's easy to say now. Try getting the initial support and funding for a process. <laughs> Try telling a funder, we don't really know what it's going to be yet. <laughs> we'll have to see what the kids come up with. It's a whole new way of thinking about youth programming, and yet many are finding funders and policy people who see the upside potential. Oops. When I think about funding and how I felt almost hypocritical writing grants, mm -hmm. using the language of the grant mm -hmm. proposal or the grant, you know, for my grant request, mm -hmm. and um, how 
sometimes you have to learn the language of the stakeholders and then translate that and communicate with young people and translate that. So you're kind of acting as a translator and, and making sure you can really evaluate what comes out of it mm -hmm. and take that back to your stakeholders. Say, well, look, you know, this is what we did and these are what resulted from it. And sure, there was some, you know, glitches in the system, but for the most part, this is the outcomes we're getting. And you have to, you have to know, don't think of it as a fight because for the most part, everyone wants young people to be successful. Mm. Nobody goes out saying, you know, I really hope kids go to jail today or whatever it is. You know, we could use some more teen pregnancies. So everyone has the right, I think has their heart in the right place when it mm. comes to young people. And so it's how do you reach them at that point? Mm -hmm. Even if they come from very different philosophical or political ideology. You know, a lot of people want the same thing. They might have different ideas on how to make the community safer. Right. But if you can show, you know what, by getting these people involved in this way and feeling important in our community, our community is safer, which is what you really wanted without having to arrest anyone. <laughs> and, and when people see that and, and you present it with facts and you, you evaluate it and you support that with stories hmm. where you have people say, this is your funding change my life in this way that's very powerful too and and usually there's tears and then there's more money <laughs> so. okay and so as difficult as it is to explain there really are some different kinds of outcomes that result from this approach. Participants feel ownership, and that impacts participation, commitment, and other individual outcomes. One young person from the garage said, before I came here, if I wanted to fight someone, I wouldn't care. Now I don't fight that much. I don't fight at all, really. I asked, how come? He said, if I get in a fight out there, it looks bad for the garage, and I get in trouble, the staff gets in trouble, you have something to lose. You don't want to mess up because it hurts you even more to know that you've hurt somebody here that you care about or the place that you care about. But not all programs will want to or will be able to provide all these types of youth engagement which is why we need an integrated network of opportunities across the community and ways to connect young people with the opportunities they need at, any, at a given time. For this to happen, youth engagement first has to be a priority within a broad base of stakeholders within organizations. These stakeholders need to be committed to creating and to finding youth engagement opportunities, processes and tools to support that, training and coaching for youth and adult leaders, participatory action research to support ongoing improvement, and summative evaluation to document outcomes. They need ongoing recruitment mechanisms because young people are constantly growing up. That means they're also constantly growing out of some of these youth engagement roles, which means we need to constantly get new young people in the door. We also need strong relationships and communication among organizations so they know what's out there, they can learn from each other, they can and they can access existing tools, training, research, and recruitment, and recruitment mechanisms while also working together to create things they need that don't already exist. A clearly defined vision for youth engagement along with data and, as Eric says, stories that show specific benefits to youth, parents, organizations, and the community at large can help get new organizations interested in joining the network and building a broad base of support across the community, including policymakers and parents. This integrated network will expand the breadth and depth of opportunities and supports available to young people. But even as we talk about all this infrastructure, it's important to realize that fundamentally, youth engagement is, a cha is about changing how youth and adults interact with each other. Talk about youth engagement. It's, it's not a, just a method. 
our methodology, our program, it's, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I'm hearing to say, that it's, it's a value commitment, it's a way of life, it's, it's something that we are passionate about and purposeful, intentional about. And so I think that's, that message needs to be sent out that mm -hmm. this is more than just gaining techniques and then going and engaging young people and thinking that we, we made it, but it's a lifestyle that includes young people mm -hmm. in our community and in our life's journey. Mm -hmm. Figure that's as good a place to end as any. Youth engagement is not a method, it's a lifestyle.